Hello, good afternoon. I'm Lalita Krishna, and I'm the moderator for this panel on navigating public media. I'm delighted to introduce our fellow panelists here, and we have uh, two people who are going to join us virtually. So um, I'm a filmmaker from Canada. I'm based in Toronto. Um, I've worked within public media, and I've worked uh, as an independent for public media. And so we'll be talking about our experiences working with public media as uh, independent producers and directors. So to start with, um, I'm going to throw it to one of our uh, panelists who's joining us virtually from the UK. It's Cassie, and I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Cassie to introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I can't, I can't see the the, the audience, but um, so my name is Cassie Corliss. Um, I'm a filmmaker based here in uh, London, in the UK. I've kind of come from the um, feature film space, feature doc space, uh, and I am currently uh, well. I, I've been developing quite a few um, hour docs with the BBC, the public broadcaster um, here in the UK, the main public broadcaster here in the UK, uh, and I am currently in the final stages of um, a doc uh, for BBC Three, which is one of the the channels here in the UK, the, a youth focused channel um that will be uh, broadcasting in two weeks time with cassie i'm going to come back to you um because that, we'd love to hear why you're not here physically with us which is something to do with your documentary i think um so we're going to move on to our panelists who's here aisha do you want to tell us a little yes, bit about yourself Hi, my name is Aisha. I'm a um, Turkish filmmaker currently living in the UK. Um, I do feature length documentaries. My first feature was called Mr. Gay Syria. And I recently finished a documentary called My Name is Happy. I was a co-director um, for it for Channel 4. So I'm here in that capacity. Wonderful. Um, and we're going to come back and talk a little more about all our experiences, but I'll throw it now to Kimberly, who's joining us also virtually. And um, so Kimberly, can you introduce yourself, please? I'm mute, but she's not there. Okay. Oh, okay. Kim's not joined us yet, so we're coming here back to Sabrina. Sabrina. I am Sabrina Aviles. I am a Latina filmmaker based out of Boston, originally from New York. Um, and right out of college, I my first job out of college was at WGBH, which is one of the huge flagship stations at, uh, in the PBS system. And uh, worked my way up there for about eight years and left. And I came back to work on um, independent series it's called uh, Latino Americans, another series called Raising Up America. Um, I worked on an American experience as an independent filmmaker, and now I'm working on my first feature that I'm hoping will um, be picked up by some sort of PBS entity and completed a um, short set is having its world premiere next, next, uh, next month. And I'm also the director of the Cinefest Latino Boston, um, which is a Latino film festival based out of Boston. Wonderful. So I see now that Kim has joined us. So Kimberly, we're going to throw it to you to introduce yourself. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I uh, wish I could be there in person. I'm coming to you from uh, Newark, New Jersey, just outside of the city on Lenape lands. Um, I am an independent documentary filmmaker. Uh, almost all of the films I've worked on have had some sort of component with public media. Um, I have also done international co-productions on almost all of them, um, so happy to talk about that as well. But um, yeah, coming to you as an independent documentary filmmaker. Wonderful. So great to have this great panel here. And um, so I'm going to throw it out um, uh, to you. We've been having a lot of conversations about what is public media and you know how is public media different what are our expectations you know i was reading up uh, definitions of public media and it's been called one of the greatest tools of democracy we talk about public media being educational upholding public values and i wonder what our experiences as filmmakers because do we 
feel that with public media, we get to make films which are edgy and provocative and a little bit different because we are kind of spared those commercial constraints of working with a private broadcaster. So Sabrina, I'm going to throw that to you first. I mean, I think the public media in the United States is composed of, uh, of PBS, um, APT, and NIDA. I'm not familiar with NIDA, but I've worked both in the PBS world and in uh, APT world. But it's largely funded by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And of course, um, foundations. Um, but its mission really is, is um, nonpartisan and it has very, very high journalistic standards. So for us as independent filmmakers, I think we all aspire to, you know, a lot of the films that we aspire to make are around issues like social justice, like health. And um, in that respect, I think that's why we look to work um, within the system, not only for the exposure, but also because over the years, the respect that it has come to um, have among audiences. So Kim, uh, we are gonna stay within the US and your experiences. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your experiences of working with public media and have you also worked with the PBS or do you have experience with any other public broadcaster? Yet? Yeah, the, the last uh, feature film that I directed um, was called Dark Money and uh, that it was pretty much a public media project from start to finish, which one might not imagine when tackling an issue that is political in nature. Um, I mean, that you know, we worked very hard to keep things nonpartisan, not because of any constraints that were com coming from uh, public media, but because I, I just felt like the argument is stronger if it doesn't get dragged into um, partisan uh, polarization, which there's just so much of in our country today. We managed to, I'm from Montana, the film is based in Montana, and we managed to tell a story about campaign finance reform using a blend of Republicans and Democrats and just hopefully it doesn't matter. We're just talking about the issue. Um, and we did that, uh, we uh, premiered on POV. We were also one of the lucky films to get a theatrical distribution from the theatrical distribution arm within PBS, which is called PBS Distribution. Um, terribly boring name, but that's what it's called. Um, <laughs> so yeah, for broadcast and theatrical, we were um, uh, public media the entire way. Um, so, you know, uh, I felt like uh, it was a really good fit for us. And we can talk more about audiences later, but just knowing that, I mean, more people have access to PBS than any other outlet in the States. And that includes streamers. And one of the big things for me was to be able to make a film that was gonna reach people who didn't inherently agree with it at, at the outset, um, so that we could kind of get outside of a lot of the algorithms and these self-selecting silos that people who are on streamers kind of get stuck in and hopefully end up in a lot of people's living rooms and maybe change some minds with this, you know, inherently policy-based film um, and do so um, because of the great reach that public media has that, that PBS, especially the POV strand and uh, PBS, uh, PBS distribution theatrically that that the, that combination of public media can have. And did that happen, you know, change people's minds? I, I mean, I think it did. We were shortlisted for the Oscar. We had a lot of, um, I, 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 yeah, I watched it. You, you watched it change minds. It was great to just kind of, we had a very um, kind of aggressive uh, impact campaign where we tried to take our film and put it in the hands of organizations that were already working in campaign finance reform. Um, there's also a parallel uh, storyline in the film that is not just about campaign finance reform, but it's about the importance of an independent journalistic, um, independent journalism so that you can cover state houses so that you can have campaign finance reform. And um, we watched 
both of those strands kind of take off with our impact campaign. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think we did. I think we really did. Um, no, but uh, I asked that question only because, I mean, there is a view of who watches public media in terms of there's an expectation that it's mostly intellectuals, it's people who are, you know, a little more artistic and, uh, you know, uphold certain values. So has that been your experience, Aisha? In terms of obviousness of public yeah. media? Um, I guess, I mean, with the Channel 4 film, we're just going to, I mean, see who the audience will be, but it's in a slot that's very much for that kind of an audience, uh, I have to say. But I think um, just coming back to your question about the sort of our relationship with, um, I just want to say something about that public media. I think my experiences are twofold in the sense that um, I come from a country where public media doesn't really exist, and therefore I don't have access to public and media. That is because of the content, the context that I work you come on. from so Turkey. Just above your yeah. That is Turkey. And then, but I'm living in the UK where had it not been for public media, I would not have been able to make the type of film that I have made in terms of content. Because when you look at it, it's not a sort of a big issue film or it's not a celebratory character, but it's, you know, it's a story on femicide that's very niche and very local, but public media is sort of the only place that allows that kind of space for an international um, content. And I think that then connects to your question about audiences is the audience of that media is actually interested in that context. And, and that is so true because I think public media does also provide that lens into the outside world, which sometimes you don't get to see elsewhere, you know, and that's uh, in the in this in the type of storytelling that we see um cassie coming to you um i guess we're all really curious because we were looking forward to meeting you in person but i think uh because of um, um your current film so tell us why you're not here and uh what 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 led to your uh sort of your uh, your reasons for staying back uh, well i mean i don't know how how much i can go into it really but you know <clears throat> sorry <laughs> well, that's um, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, I, I wouldn't go into any gossip or anything like that, but it's just, um, I, you know, I I was meant to have finished, um, I, I mean, the, it, it actually kind of is interesting because it, some of it also fits into a question that you were asking Aisha, um, just, or actually a more general statement that you were making about public media being this thing that is kind of, you know, um, stereotypically seen as catering to um, intellectuals and people of a certain um, political um, alignment and people who, you know, like, um, like thinking in the in the high arts and high cultural fields. But, you know, I think in the UK, I would kind of challenge that, actually, because I think the BBC mm -hmm. is like such a, and also, you know, in the case of Channel 4, I think that these are such massive cultural institutions um, and they're part like, you know, they're real strong uh, parts of the mainstream um, media landscape. So, you know, I, in so doing, I think that they also, you know, there's part of them that does cater to that side, but I think that they're also, um, very, you know, that that the, there's a, there's a lot of populist content. Um, you know, uh, when you when you really go into it, you know, there are a lot of soap operas, there's lots of reality TV, there's lots of stuff that's catered to young people. There's lot, like, for example, I mean, the the reason that I kind of mentioned that is because my film is for BBC Three, and BBC Three. Um, I don't know how much people know about BBC Three um, in the room, but it's um, essentially the BBC's um, youth focused channel. Um, so essentially, you know, the, the, the target audience is um, 30, 30, 30 and less. Um, there's a lot of, you know, they do have reality stuff. They have stuff called like um, sun, sex and suspicious parents. They have things about like, um, you know, there's, there's stuff about like, uh, quote unquote, gang wars and like binge drinking. And um, but they also, you know, for example, BBC Three was the first channel that had Fleabag, um, you know, a, 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 co a comedy drama that kind of went, you know, massively international. Um, but, you know, all that to say that it's a channel that isn't necessarily um, catering towards mm. the um, quote unquote intellectual, uh, you know, high arts, high culture um, crowd that maybe in the US, you know, it's kind of seen as as that's where the the, the PBS 
um, crowd would kind of be. Um, and so BBC Three, because it's a youth focused, um, because it's a youth focused channel, and also because of the the I guess the prevailing slightly anti-public broadcaster sentiment that is um you know that is quite present in the uk at the moment especially you know when we when we kind of um when we look at it from the the when we look at it through the lens of um current party politics like especially when we look at the conservative party and uh and you know the the trust government has kind of you know be, while they were government in waiting kind of spoke about the fact that they wanted to sell channel four and um it's you know a, a bad you know it's not a well hidden secret that the um conservative government or the conservative party in general is kind of uh, has kind of got the bbc in its crosshairs um, and i think that all of that kind of makes for a you know, a general environment in which uh, both Channel 4 and the BBC and the BBC, you know, has um, quite a lot of um, at least, um, you know, they, they have lots of different like channels, they have lots of different TV channels, you've got one, two, three, four, but four is kind of dying and then you've got the iPlayer and then you've got all the radio channels and you've got news and all of that stuff. Um, all of these kind of, you know, in, in aggregate, that's like eight or nine channels really, um, kind of definitely feel under attack. And I think that that has kind of um, led to an environment in which um, these two main public broadcasters kind of feel the need to really be justifying themselves um, mm. to their audiences. Um, so that's one stakeholder, but also to the government in one way. Um, and I think that that what that that's mean and the way that I've kind of experienced it is that it's um, you know the sense that you know we have to we have to show that we're in touch and we have to show that we're making the thing the kinds of things that people are demanding um, and the kinds of things that you know can um, rival Netflix or that at least are, are are peaking the interest of young in my case peaking the interest of young audiences and so that kind of brings back brings us back to to, to the to the to the question of why I'm not there um, is that you know the film that I'm working on which is basically a film about Virgil Abloh who is a um, fashion designer, African-American fashion designer, Ghanaian American fashion designer um, from Rockford, Illinois, in the outskirts of Chicago, um, who uh, was Kanye West's creative director, um, who founded a brand called Off-White, but also, you know, who, who in the later years of his life, because he passed away last year, um, became the creative director um, for uh, menswear at Louis Vuitton. Um, so obviously, you know, like ma a massive deal, a massive deal to have a, a black person in um, a traditional French haute couture or a, a, a massive French house really, um, because, you know, he really was the, the second black person in history to, to have acceded to that role. The first person being Oswald Boateng, who um, was the creative director for Givenchy. Um, and so, you know, Virgil is 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 a pretty complicated character, or interesting in lots of different ways. You know, you could attack it from the um, high culture perspective. You could attack it from the hip hop perspective. You could attack it from the youth perspective. There's so many different ways in which you could approach this film. And you know, personally, this is an aside, but you know, my film is an hour long. I think that he is someone who really you know deserves like that uh, and I know maybe we'll talk about like the Ken Burns kind of treatment of an eight hour sprawling thing about this man's life because he did like so many amazing things <laughs> but anyway so because this person was so multifaceted and there's so many different things that you could say about them there were you know that there kind of was always this thing with the channel of um you know their idea of what a youthful documentary should be and like the idea of like what like what are the things that will really attract a young audience and, and you know whether that's the content or whether um it's a stylistic treatment and things like that and that has kind of been you know a back and forth for for a long while um and you know this is a film that kind of essentially everyone was happy with everyone in our team was kind of happy with and um we were working you know like working to to a deadline last friday um you know a delivery deadline last friday and everything seemed um, cool and then kind of at the last minute you know we got some channel notes that meant that um, you know it was substantial enough changes that uh, and you know the changes were kind of you know speaking to this thing of essentially you know questioning is this attractive enough to to young people is it you know is it um wowy enough uh, is it like you know does it have that does it have that thing that is really going to draw this audience that we view as our target audience and this audience who we who we think we know once once um and so yeah so you know that's the I, I feel like that's maybe a long version of the story um but i felt like there were lots of different things that i thought kind of 
linked into the conversation that we're having here. Um, but yeah, that is that is why I'm, I'm not in LA and I'm in cold, cold London at the moment. Right. Um, no, I mean, I, I really like the long version of the story because you touched on many um, different topics and themes that actually we want to address. So I'm glad you, I can segue right into it. Uh, speaking from my perspective in terms of Canada, we also have uh, our uh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, which is, you know, like uh, modeled on the BBC in some ways because uh, it's uh, funded by our government. And you know we've we've encountered very similar situations where there's a constant threat of mm. changing governments and constantly um, you know the CBC is always up for cutbacks or being questioned to the point where there is a huge commercial um, aspect to this broadcaster now. So in fact, we'll see shows like Who Wants to Beat a Fifth Grader, and there are these game shows and sort of. But then they also have the only remaining documentary strands on um, in terms of uh, because all our private broadcasters have removed this documentary strands. They don't even make any show of keeping something on, you know, because what passed for documentary was often reality shows. So that's uh, but even that's kind of disappearing in some ways. So um, that brings us to the question of um, you know, public broadcasters in terms of being at the whim of changing governments. And um, we see that a lot because in Canada, you know, every time we have a conservative government, there's there's this questioning about whether or not we should continue. And there's a staunch group of people who believe that we shouldn't be funding uh, a broadcaster who is whom they believe is to be left wing because any criticism of the government is always seen as supporting you know, the liberal point of view, regardless of the fact that when the liberals are in power, there are critical, uh, there are there are quite a lot of analysis about that, the existing government anyway, uh, the government in power. Um, what is, uh, is that a threat that public broadcasting always faces and everywhere? Uh, have you encountered that, Sabrina? I mean, I think here, we definitely there's always, um, anytime a conservative a government, uh, uh, gets into power, um, such as our, our previous uh, president, if you can call that. Um, there's always that. There, there's always that language, you know. And I think that although programmers, um, you know, um, probably say that that doesn't affect their choices. I think that in those periods where you're hearing a lot of vocalizing about cutting back um, CPB funding for PBS, um, that I think programmers tend to tread very lightly and carefully. Um, um, and, and sometimes are very open about, you know, um, sending um, letters and emails to their constituency. So they say, you know, contact your representatives, local representatives, and let them know that, you know, public broadcasting, public media is, is necessary, but um, I do think that those conversations um, happen and make people nervous in, in places, and um, and and it's I think it's the con constant threat. And given what is happening in this country um, and how polarizing the politics have been, I don't think anything is um, impossible anymore. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. so um, I think that. Um, you know, but I, I, I do feel that public broadcasting, as we spoke about before, you know, to say that um, we are left wing, I, I feel like, you know, public media is really about the highest journalistic standards, you know, having worked on several programs, I, I told um, Alita before that I literally, it's like writing a thesis where you have to cite um, first and secondary sources and hand in pages of, put, of footnotes with your fact checking a program mm -hmm. um, um, because you, there's no other way to, uh, they would not accept, a, um, that's just part of the deliverable. So, so, but I just think that in this country, um, you know, so many, again, so polarizing and so many people are being um, silenced, if you will. So, I don't know, but I, I don't, it, 
I personally feel that, that it makes people nervous, you know, and, and then you have to question, what does that mean in terms of filmmaking mm -hmm. and filmmaking, filmmakers taking risks, you I know, mean, yeah. so. I mean, I want, I actually want to add on that in terms of not just the content that's being covered, but what does that mean to filmmakers, both from the perspective of what does it mean to young filmmakers if that kind of public media doesn't exist, because what are you left with is sort of private institutions like Netflix. How is a 20 year old young filmmaker going to pitch even or prepare a teaser that's 10,000 pounds in order to sell a film to Netflix? That's question number one. And the second one is, especially, for example, if you look at the, the strands in the UK, BBC and Channel 4 are probably the only places where you can cover international subject matters. So production companies, there's three or four production companies that specifically do international content. So if it gets privatized or if that public media doesn't exist, what does that mean in terms of, you know, <laughs> knowing what's going on in the world versus just your sort of local national stories? And also to filmmakers like me who are trying to make a living in the UK, who live in the UK, who probably will not get hired for dispatches because, <laughs> you know, that, you know, I it's not the same type of qualifications. So what does that mean to diversity in terms of having diverse voices in the filmmaking community? Yeah. Um, so can, can you add to that? Because um, I think both from the perspective of a filmmaker wanting to make the kind of film you want to make in terms of um, the priorities of the public broadcaster shifting priorities, I guess, as might be the case, um, in Cassie's story that, you know, in terms of things may shift with a new person coming there in terms of their belief on who the audience is. Mm -hmm. um, what would you, uh, would you like to talk about your experiences? Um, you know, as, as a, an American filmmaker who, uh, you know, so much of the documentary landscape, um, it's hard to make a documentary without thinking of public media as being an outlet for your film um, one way or another but I think in the states it is different than a lot of the international documentary filmmaking I've seen in that it's only one of the options that we're going to and I think that folks based in the UK are going to be thinking about their film going to public media on BBC much more than we are um, I'm in this cohort of documentary filmmakers. I happen to be the only um, American in there. Everybody else I, I talk to is dealing with their national film institute and their public broadcaster and has a much tighter um, relationship with them than I ever would with any particular individual at public media at, at a strand like POV or ITVS, um, just because of the dynamics of the filmmaking in their country. Um, so because of that, to answer your question, I think that to set out and make a film that's just for public media is not a constraint that I think we have as Americans as much as folks who are ensconced in their national filmmaking industry. Um, I, um, I, I have, you know, had kind of glancing interactions with that because all of the films that I've worked on have had a component of like Prodigal Sons was a co-production with CBC and BBC, Storyville. Um, Dark Money had a lot of uh, international co-production components as well. Um, but I think that, um, when you set out to make it, um, at, and I'm just kind of trying to make the best film and then find a home for it later. Now, the big exception to that, I think, um, is are folks who get uh, ITVS development funding and production funding. And when that's the when that's the case, you kind of end up in this in in this channel of this project has been started and supported and. Yeah, uh, has, re, re, you know, reporting back to them guidelines that you need to follow that tends to, I think, maybe hem folks in. Um, but from my perspective, not having gone through that ITBS funding pipeline, 
Um, I can't say it. I, I, I really don't feel constrained by it until, you know, after the film is made. Um, um, so Aisha, you touched on diversity and mm -hmm. um, the question of we, we would talked a lot about this just in terms of uh, responsibility of the public broadcaster to reflect diversity and reflect diverse stories so that the perspective of the stories that we get from the public broadcast isn't just, you know, you know, one kind of one group. So um, what has been that experience? I can tell you in Canada, for example, we've got, uh, so we've got educational broadcasters in a couple of provinces who are large enough that they are public broadcasters because they're publicly funded or government funded. Um, and one of them came under um, scrutiny by a group of people who, who said there isn't sufficient stories being told by our indigenous populations, by black and racialized filmmakers. So they pushed them to do an equity audit. And as a result of that equity audit there, um, which you know showed appalling numbers, the data was very, very um, uh, clear in terms of showing that there was so such a small percentage of funding that actually went to filmmakers who are black racialized and uh, uh, and um, uh, from indigenous communities. As a result, we we had a situation where you know we the CEO had to resign, and now it's become a big issue. And there is a push to have this equity audit being conducted at all our broadcasters. And um, so the question is, we are living in changing times. There is a big push. I mean, ever since George Floyd, the world has woken up again. What is the role of the public? Uh, you know, again, we go back to public broadcasters and say, you are kind of a beacon. You, you're expected to be better than the others. But in reality, that's really not the case. Um, has that been your experience, uh, Sabrina? I don't think we have enough time. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think everybody knows here about beyond inclusion. Uh, and I'm not going to get into that because I think there'll be other panels um, sort of um, discussing the aftermath of that, you know, um, uh, you know, the demographics of, of public media has always been largely white. And I think that, um, you know, in spaces like GBH, and I'll speak from my own experience, um, it, you know, they have tried, I don't know how successfully to, you know, the mandate has always been for the public good, you know, and so how do you define public? when the public is changing in terms of the, the racial um, and social economic profiles. So yes, it's P PBS, um, public media, for many is considered sort of a, a kind of a dinosaur and someone that needs to get with the time. But to its credit, you know, it has um, spaces like POV and Independent Lens and, and World Channel where we see much more diverse voices, and not only from the United States, but from all over the world, telling stories in 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 beautiful and um, maybe thought provoking ways. Um, um, and uh, Ashton and I were talking about that. I came up through public media, and there is a certain standard of um, language of filmmaking um, that is great for any young mm -hmm. filmmaker. But that, you know, as filmmakers, we are artists and we want to expand about that language. And I think that, you know, forums and series like POV, like Independent Lens, like America Refrained, like the World Channel is, gives us an opportunity to expand about the, uh, 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 expand our, our filmmaking language. Um, more so because, um, you know, in so big, in this country, we don't see it as often as we would see it down in Latin America and in Europe. Um, again, we were talking about this yesterday. As when I curate the film festival, I'm astounded as at at how um, documentary filmmakers outside of the United States really push the boundaries of storytelling. So, you know, there are films that are not necessarily character driven. So, going back to that, yeah, I think the challenge is that. Um, there are audiences now that are challenging public media to even expand upon those um, those formats, those those series, 
to have much more diverse um, characters and it's and it, it's not characters but personnel within the system you know um, and it's happening but again it's a big cultural shift and culture takes a long time to change that's right and I think um, Cassie you may have been talking about that in in it sounds like what happened with you in terms of your um, you know the editorial uh, push in terms of figuring out a shift in terms of who, who, what your audience might want to see. So maybe you can expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you know, I wouldn't say that there was necessarily a, I, I, you know, I wouldn't say that there was a shift during the time of the production necessarily, but I just, you know, I, I, I just felt that it was in, important to, you know, note how indicative of the general environment it was that, you know, that we're, that, you know, from the channel down, it's like, you know, thinking about like what do you like all the assumptions about like what young people want and like how we're like essentially going to keep on justifying ourselves or feel like we're justing justifying ourselves to like a broad audience to a young audience um i i mean i one thing that aisha was kind of talking about that i thought was interesting was this 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 idea of um public broadcasters as gateways for um for you know for young filmmakers for new filmmakers and i certainly think that that's true and i saw there was a question in the q a um just asking about um uh, you know the 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 best strands the best avenues for up-and-coming filmmakers to to maybe you know like get onto public broadcasters and this has been a conversation that i've been having with the the public broadcasters or at least with the bbc um was just around like it feels that, you know, ironically, it feels that there are more and more opportunities, or, or at least there are more and more streams, there are more and more avenues through which people can put films out. Um, but it seems, you know, and this is from, my, you know, this is me as an individual, this is from my, like, individual perspective, like, I kind of see fewer and fewer, like, you know, schemes or strands or, like, clear avenues through which people can actually like get into like getting your thing on TV, getting into public broadcasting, like making things, being supported properly. Um, and, you know, one of the conversations that I was having was about BBC Four in particular. And again, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how much um, people in the in the collected audience know about BBC structure, but BBC Four was, it was that one that, you know, you would maybe say is um, most traditionally or, or, or most stereotypically in line with um, how maybe you view PBS in the sense that, you know, it was um, it was like art culture focused. It was about like, you know, like political figures. It was a bit es esoteric. It, it also allowed for experimental documentary making, it allowed for lots of these different things. And um, BBC4 is a channel that, you know, last year from last year kind of um, essentially um, is being wound, wound down. Uh, because they used to be um, commissioning original documentaries. Now they kind of only are commissioning um, live events and arts events and things like that and doing reruns. Um, they were a terrestrial TV, uh, a terrestrial TV channel. Um, now uh, I know it was kind of given its marching orders in terms of, you know, it might not even be a terrestrial TV channel anymore. Um, and the, the reason that I kind of point to that channel is that it was because it it kind of allowed for experimentation and because it was a bit more arts focused um it allowed for you know for for people who maybe didn't have that much experience or people who weren't necessarily making the kinds of films that you know you would expect to be on a, a mainstream channel like you know the, the kinds of things that uh, you know if you're outside of the mainstream the kinds of thing if you're uh you've got a interesting political ideas if you've got interesting artistic things that you want to try like that was kind of the avenue through which um, you could maybe do things like one of their most famous strands was a strand called arena um, and i actually had um, a few things in development with with that strand but actually it kind of all happened in amidst this um you know as i was talking about before like this prevailing um kind kind of environment of uh the the BBC public broadcasting, again, trying to justify itself and not wanting to seem too esoteric and wanting to seem as though, it, you know, it, it's this thing that is for everyone, um, which, you know, has this, I guess, this ironic side effect of not necessarily catering to anyone anymore, because again, you know, and maybe this is another conversation, but I, I also think that there's the, you know, the pressures of being in a new landscape in which streaming is massive and in which, you know, 
massive um, international documentaries, massive documentaries with huge bu huge budgets um, are kind of rivaling the, the fare that um, public broadcasters are making. And obviously, you know, they can't necessarily compete uh, on, on, on budgets and on price and things like that. Um, so it's kind of left a really, at least, you know, again, from my perspective, um, left us in a in a really interesting uh, moment and a, an interesting um, environment as documentary makers, I think. Mm. I guess this is a question for you, Aisha. There's a question from Jay Applewhite asking for people making, how do filmmakers navigate licensing rights, especially if you've got part funding from public media and part funding from outside, and it's it's about a foreign uh, or a, a subject matter that might be say from turkey yes. how do you go about well the main negotiate? commissioner is channel four so they're the main commissioner and then channel four finds partners for example with my name's happy the partners that came on board were arte again um a public funder and then uh, a danish television came on board so it depends the person that's the main commissioner obviously has the more rights but this could be you know the content matter does it doesn't really matter it could be from anywhere in the world um so the fact that it's turkish content doesn't mm -hmm. change it um and there's another question here by jayashri um so saying that what attracted them to pbs was a decentralized distribution process Stations had their freedom to carry their own or other shows of local interest over shows made for national distribution by um, PBS, uh, their own internal productions. And that's not the case anymore. And um, Kim, since you talked a little bit about PBS distribution, <laughs> PBS distributing, the name that you called it, um, do you want to address is that is, is their observation correct? You know, I'm not sure. I saw that question and it was interesting. I just don't know. I, I would really like to see those numbers about, you know, which films go and how broad the distribution is within the PBS network. Um, you know, maybe some of the other folks can, could talk to that as well. Um, I will say that I've heard both anecdotes, like, for example, with Dark Money, um, there was a lot of debate about dark money policy in the state of Missouri, hardly, you know, a liberal bellwether. Uh, so it was great to have um, screenings in Missouri, not only uh, in, in the public media system is very complicated. I think I got even more confused about how complicated it was after delving in a little bit, um, but some places the public television is also the, run by the same entity that NPR, National Public Radio, or the, like the national radio comes from. Um, in some cases, that's really good. In Missouri, we were able to have a screening that public television covered, and we also did a Q&A that went out on NPR. Uh, it was great. Um, I've also heard stories about people who make um, LGBTQ content that is picked up by some stations, but doesn't get picked up by the Kentucky affiliate, for example, or the Texas station. And uh, all of that is anecdotal. Um, so I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. I think um, that as was mentioned earlier, that there, there are some shifting tides when different administrations roll in and there's kind of a feeling that folks have to keep, programmers have to keep their head down a little bit. Um, I also am very glad that Big Bird is alive and thriving because I think that the number of times that Big Bird and Sesame Street have saved public television um, is like more than any of us could count. Um, so this is a question here, which is really interesting, which is about um, um, public broadcasters nurturing new talent, being incubators of emerging talent, and what is that role that they play there? And I can tell you from Canada, for sure, when you, if it is a if it is a racialized filmmaker or a, or a black filmmaker, for sure they'll be seen as emerging, no matter if they've been emerging for 13 years, and that's <laughs> someone said, but they're always emerging. Um, 
and which is fine as long as you get to do that and then move on. Um, the question is, oh, how does that work? Do you see um, public broadcasters as being um, incubators of new talent? I don't know if it, it's public broadcasters per se. It's other organizations that work with public broadcasting. That said, I think I'm thinking of ITBS. ITBS a fund has a fund that I, I was actually a recipient of the Diversity Development Fund. Um, that's specifically for um, filmmakers of color and emerging filmmakers. Um, um, and but I also think that there are other entities um, like Firelight Media that work that a lot of their workshops and um, and mentoring programs eventually. Um, the films there end up um, on public broadcasting or get made or even appear in in huge film festivals like like Sundance. So um, off the top of my head, I'm thinking of, of ITVS as the only one that's directly affiliated with, you know, if you get ITVS funding, there's a potential that you can eventually get your film aired on POV or independent lens or um, or America refrained, but um, I'm not aware. I may, I mean, I'm not the expert, so I'm, I may not be, I may be wrong. I mean, there might be something else. So, but I think there's a lot of other entities that right. are nurturing that talent yeah. to eventually end up in public media. And then, um, I mean, there was something here about short content as well, which is, yeah. I know that um, in Canada, I can definitely say that short form content is really it's a much easier way of getting in through the door, but whether or not you ever get to make long, because it's, it's a completely different Yeah, and I think process. there's more support for that now, um, um, because it is much more viable to make a short than it is. A smaller feature. budget. But it's also um, becomes like school. Like I made so many yeah. short content that were actually documentary 101 for me. So I think it's important in that terms as well, not just, you know. Yeah, because yeah, when you're yeah. doing a feature, you're in it for the long haul. It mm. could be years. And where shorts is contained, and yeah, you mm. are fine tuning in those story mm -hmm. storytelling skills. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I do want to go to an area which I think we we should really get into, which is who should care about public media. I mean, does the public care about public media? Mm -hmm. You know, and the question is, what you know, how much do we shout and scream from the rooftops when public media? Um, budgets are cut off, for instance, something happens with them because we are all working with public media, we can be critical of everything, but we are blessed with public media, seriously. It's, mm -hmm. it's a huge, um, we want to preserve that, preserve them as institutions, especially if we know of countries where there is no such thing as, as, as uh, editorial independence within public media, you know, it's kind of, um, uh, government propaganda machine. So um, we should care. So how do we how do we get the public motivated about public media? Can I, I just want to quote something that I I read on Instagram, you guys, uh, from I think it was a, a group called Puerto Rican Documentary Filmmakers, and they said it was a wonderful quote that said, "A country without documentary is like a family without a uh, photo album." And I just think that, you know, I, I love that quote because I really think that um, most of what you see is on public television, on public media is our documentary. And, you know, and also it's it's basically the biggest, as far as I know, it's, it's probably the biggest format where you actually see historical documentaries. How many historical documentaries get into film festivals? Not a lot, mm. but they're the perfect vehicle for public media. So I really think that it's important because it provides, you know, it's a it's a form to provide context and history and education. And I think we should care. We, we should care. I think if I might jump here, aside from historical documentaries, also I'm kind of, I see myself within this group as the cautionary tale coming from the cautionary tale country where it used to be the case that we would apply to public funding just for the sake of applying but kind of knowing that we would never get it, but now we're at a point where we don't apply because we might actually get into trouble if the the, the 
the people who run the public sort of TVs or fundings actually know the content matter that we're doing. But then we were, before coming here this morning in, in our little sort of cab ride, we were talking about how, you know, it's not just Turkey, but that's kind of spreading with Italy and Hungary and um, they were saying Germany and France and, and all, all sorts of like everybody's sort of turning inward. So I think, you know, the cautionary tales aren't for specific countries, but it's kind of this ripple effect that's going. So this is why I think um, that, I mean, your quote in the beginning of what public media is and why it matters so much. But how to raise voices, <laughs> I don't know, that's a difficult question. I think that's that's really important because I think when the public media becomes tools of proper, uh, you know, and, and then becomes the book's um, arm for for governments or dictatorships, then we're really in big trouble because mm -hmm. we do need that independent voice. And I think I'm going to throw it to Kim here because I would like to hear from you in terms of how do we protect and ensure the independence of public media. You know what, if it's okay, um, I'm going to loop in some of the questions that I'm seeing in the chat about short films, because it seems like there's a lot of interest in people starting on in short films. And I think that one of the things that public media can do that really needs to do is to adapt to a lot of uh, media landscape that is changing and changing fast. Um, younger generation, Gen Z, that I do any of them watch public me i don't probably not turn on the old they, you know they pbs YouTube. they watch youtube they watch short film video so finding uh, and maybe it happens as we're talking about in the public media structure in the us maybe it happens with the local affiliates pushing out you know short snippets of social media um, that younger generations can consume uh, but I think that a, a, a large kind of shift in thinking really needs to happen there. And that mm -hmm. also, you know, some of the shorter content can really encourage um, younger and developing filmmakers to come along too. I think also PBS does have PBS shorts that yeah. streams. I think they've mentioned and that. One of, I produced a short for them a couple of years ago for Latino public broadcasting, and it was streaming, on, it's still streaming on YouTube. And then it, it also streamed on PBS Short. So definitely they're going in that direction. They're exploring that because again, being perceived as the dinosaur, they have they have no other choice but to explore these new media landscapes. So Cassie, mm -hmm. uh, since you had the first word, I'm gonna give you the last as well. Um, with the imminent um, changes at channel four, you know, I'm back to the question of who should care about public media because that is a pretty dangerous precedent that, you know, one of the election mandates and sort of um, that that this government came in or somebody came in to say that they're going to sell Channel 4, um, you should, I mean, we should all be concerned. So tell us what your thoughts are about that. Um, I'm by no means an expert, um, <laughs> you know, and I think that my speculation is probably as good as anybody else's. Um, I think that in a kind of ironic twist. I think that Liz Truss and her government kind of, you know, were um, kind of touted as this government that were, was going to, you know, slap like cut and burn like so much stuff, so much in terms of like state infrastructure, so much in terms of services, you know, and I mean, and, and again, don't know how much everyone's been following this in the US, but you know, um, had the announcement of a mini budget that, you know, that entailed um, big tax cuts for uh, the high earners in the UK, uh, also um, talked about giving bonuses to bankers, also talked about um, underwriting um, essentially energy subsidies for everyone and not necessarily thinking about uh, inequalities and in access to energy. And, and I, I think that, you know, this government, for me, it kind of seemed that they were um, guaranteed, essentially, to do away with Channel 4. Um, but I'm not necessarily convinced that this government's going to make it, really. Um, mm -hmm. I think that um, there's been, or, you know, there's, there's massive backlash fermenting just because, you know, and I'm sure you've seen this, like, the, plan, the pound has obviously plunged um, in its exchange to the dollar, um, to its lowest rate ever. 
um, a few days ago, was it yesterday? Um, or historical lows, because I think it was to its 1985 lows. I think that it might literally be at an all time low. Um, and I think that, you know, if we know anything about the UK is that people care about their money. Um, and I think that <laughs> although the Conservative government has had a really long run, um, it's, you know, it's very possible that uh, another government um, is able to come in um, before that. But that might be wishful thinking, because I also think that clearly the people in power right now are very much intent on, um, you know, doing as much as um, they feel is right in the time that they have. I think that they probably know that they have a limited time. Um, I think that a Labour government has a very different um, view of public broadcasting. I think that there have been really interesting conversations around um, pushing public broadcasting outside of uh, the purview of the government, which I think would, you know, I think that that would really safe, be able to safeguard it to some extent, because at the moment, you know, the government does have some say in who gets um, what position in the in the BBC. Um, and I, not sure exactly how it works at Channel 4, but also, you know, we know that they have, um, you know, they, they, they have an impact on the financial instruments that then go to finance the BBC. Obviously, Channel 4 is funded wholly by advertising, even though it's publicly owned. And um, we have all those kind of things. And I think that there has been interesting discussions around remote, like moving public broadcasting out of uh, the control of government to, to safeguard it, at least um, for future generation. I think that that's a really interesting conversation. I think it's an important conversation um, to be had. And I think that um, though people might not um, at the moment, especially because one of the questions is about young people, like people might not necessarily understand um, the uh, the importance of public broadcasting. But I do think that, you know, when you compare it to America, and obviously you do have a public broadcaster, but I think when you, when you uh, compare the um, the 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 the, invi the 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 media landscape in the UK, or at least the news landscape, I think maybe is the the the, the one in which you can see it the most clearly. Um, is very different because we have you know um, strong public broadcasters and strong public broadcasters that are trusted. Obviously, that you know that trust is kind of being called into question a lot. Um, but I think that it may it, it makes for a slightly more healthy. Um, uh, you know, context for public debate. Um, and I think that, you know, it's kind of, even though I wouldn't say that I necessarily watch the BBC or Channel 4 that much, I think that I recognise their importance in being, you know, standard bearers to some extent um, that, you know, I guess kind of, you know, sig signal um, what is expected when you put things out in this, um, in this environment. We were just going to put you in charge of the campaign to protect <laughs> <broadcasters>, but after <laughs> that <laughs> declaration <laughs> we're going to rethink that strategy but thank you so much to all our panelists thank you to everyone who's here and to all our audiences um thank you to idea for this panel thank you thank you, thank you. thanks everyone <laughs>